Charles Barkley takes on load management in the NBA and exposes the generational differences of what it means to be weak-minded. And yes, he is right. The current professional athlete is not what it once was. I also put keyboard warriors on blast who call themselves journalists when they realize they're no longer on Twitter. And we take a sneak peek into the 10 year old who caught the World Series walk off Grand Slam in Los Angeles all here on the Bullock today. So let's do it. The mainstream news is so corrupt. This is unbelievable. This is wild. No one is talking about this. The shootings are just out of control right now. You don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed. Now to Charles Barkley here on Joel Embiid. As someone finally calls out NBA athletes, or should I say the league of Instagram models, who play basketball in their spare time. This comes after Joel Embiid announced that he will not play back-to-back games in the NBA for the remainder of his career. I'm going to play the clip here of Charles Barkley right now. He just signed for three years, $193 million. Three years, $193 million to play basketball. We're not steel workers. We're not nurses. Like, People who got like real jobs who have to work 40, 50 hours a week. We, we're playing basketball at the most four days a week. Most of the time, three days a week. To come out and say it in, a, in advance was a stupidity by the Sixers, period. Now this moment really makes me harp on Dave Chappelle's most Shakespearean moment in describing the setting of today's overall social institutions. Whole country has turned into bitch ass niggas. <laughs> This is pathetic. Joel Embiid, the former 2022-2023 NBA MVP, which should have gone to Jokic, clearly at this point, already announcing before this NBA season has even started that he will not suit up for back-to-back games, all while recently signing a $193 million dollar contract with the Philadelphia 76ers. Embiid is as soft as the diapers my baby niece gets changed into. What a soft generation that we live in. Why doesn't he just go out onto the court wearing shoulder pads and a helmet at this point? Philadelphia, which is supposed to be the city of badasses and man children, might as well host a block party to have their nails painted and their makeup done so they ensure they look good for when the Boston Celtics come in and clobber them by 60 points, which everybody will now be rooting for them. They deserve it. Not sure how Allen Iverson, the legendary pound-for-pound 76er, has stayed silent on this obvious declaration of duty by the so-called star of the team who was just crowned most valuable player in the NBA two short years ago. Let's try this out. Tomorrow, let me get up and tell my boss that I can't make it into work tomorrow because I already worked today. (laughs) He'll laugh right in my face. He'll also laugh right in your face if you told your boss the same thing. Now let me break this down for you, Barney style. An NBA game is made up of four quarters, each being 12 minutes long. That means if you played every minute of every quarter during every game, you would have worked 40 minutes in total that day, which is less than an hour. And factoring in how many stops and commercial breaks there are during an NBA game, you're limited to working a max of probably about two to three minutes straight at any given time. According to NBA.com, Embiid is averaging only 34 minutes per game, which is the equivalent of refusing to work for a half hour one day and then working a half hour the next day. This is also including having the best medical staff at your immediate disposal the world has ever seen in the athletic community. Calling this circumstance anything but a lazy form of greed and athletic welfare is being dishonest 
to your own consumer. Let's note as well, this prima donna has never won an NBA playoff game beyond the second round, which in all of sports, an NBA championship is the easiest championship to win. This makes me wish that Michael Jordan was almost done building the NBA version of Noah's Ark when he was finally retiring. Now moving on to thumbs up, we head over into Dallas, Texas now. Thumbs up, average Joes can play. With thumbs up to Trayvon Diggs here from the Dallas Cowboys. Getting into it with an NFL reporter after the game. Mike Leslie of WFAA ABC 8 Dallas tweeted during the Dallas Cowboys game, what is Trayvon Diggs doing on this play? In which Diggs obviously got wind of this and confronted the porter face to face after the game. Took from that, out of that whole play, that's what you took from that? You don't know football. You can't do nothing that I do. You can't go out there and do nothing. Stay in your lane, buddy. Stop playing me, bro. Just asking the question, Trayvon. I mean, I'm happy to have you answer the question. That's what you got from now. That whole play, that's what you got from now. I'm asking. Now, I love this, as sports reporters seem to forget that during these post-game interviews, they are indeed not on Twitter anymore. This is real life. You can't hide behind your keyboard anymore, and someone has to give a little heat check to these former Greek life frat boys who have never played an athletic sporting event in their life and are now critiquing the world's best athletes play by play from the luxury of their soft couch cushions. Football players end up getting the brunt of this criticism with probably Skip Bayless being the president of absolute absurd athletic journalism here. And I'm happy to see that Trayvon Diggs had enough with this shit and is not afraid of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a keyboard warrior who hides behind the cameras during a post-game interview. And now thumbs down. <laughs> to TikTok here as the viral subway surfing in New York City has claimed yet another young life, unfortunately. A 13-year-old boy in Queens has died after a video showed the 13-year-old jogging on top of an elevated subway car. Moments later, falling, sustaining life-ending injuries. Within the last two weeks alone, two teen girls also fell from a southbound 7 train on 111th Street while surfing the dangerous subway trains, leaving one dead with another experiencing life-threatening injuries. Also to blame here, other than just TikTok, is peer pressure, social media, lack of parental supervision, cowardly bystanders not saying or doing anything, and last but not least, the fifth being city leaders. If you're a mayor, congressperson, or councilperson, this is your city. This is clearly not a one-time problem. You have known this to be a problem for a few years now that teens are dying while doing a TikTok trend on top of running trains. Now, sometimes we don't realize how quickly time has passed, which is why I bring to you this day in history. which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. The president has been shot. Now this day, 95 years ago, the famous Black Tuesday absolutely obliterated the U.S. stock markets back in 1929. The Dow falling 12% in one day was the largest drop in the Dow's history at the time. Thousands of investors being absolutely wiped out overnight, leading to the Great Depression, which would then have global consequences for the next several decades. World War II being specific. Germany at the time, a few short years before the rise of the Nazi party, was reliant on American loans for economic recovery after World War I. 
The U.S. then recalled these loans after that stock market crash, and Germany's economy also then crashed, leading to a massive depression in Germany and people looking for a change in Germany, which gave Adolf Hitler and the Nazis an opportunity to then step into the spotlight. The Dow would not return to its pre-crash heights until 25 years later in 1954. Now, a lot of times covering the news can get nasty. You're talking a lot about bad things most of the time. So each news show, I will ensure that I do cover some good news here as it does still exist. In these hyper-polarized times and world that we do live in now, yes, there are some still good news. Some very good things to harp on. So good news as we head over to Los Angeles, California now. Here we go. Go. If you've heard about the Grand Slam, a walk-off home run in Game 1 of the World Series between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the New York Yankees, you may have not realized that the ball indeed eventually did land, and someone caught it. Ten-year-old Zach from Venice was able to catch the ball in the outfield and take home a piece of baseball history while at the game with his father. Nico, Zach's father, surprised his son that day with tickets earlier for a special surprise. Obviously, courtesy of Fred, Freddie Freeman, which was the very first walk-off Grand Slam in World Series history, which was an absolutely unforgettable moment, as catching this baseball is an absolute one-of-a-kind baseball in the 152 years of MLB history, which almost dates back to the Civil War itself. It is the only one with this accolade of being a walk-off Grand Slam in the World Series, which is a future very high bidding item for the museum over at Cooperstown, I bet. So awesome stuff there. And remember that there is always some good news out there. You just have to look for it. Now your daily news podcast, The Bullock is out Tuesday through Thursday at 5 p.m. And I will be back here tomorrow evening with another round of The Bullock for your world news stories. And I will see you then. News and factual material are deeply researched through confirming the validity of multiple sources by the broader media landscape across the global sector in the digital world. All statements are a combination of primary and secondary research components geared towards providing the only new show in video and podcast form that provides a clear understanding of important world issues that are being left out by the completely biased and politically driven global media machine. Thank you for listening.